I was a good dancer, I'd probably do a little something, but <laughs> I won't. <laughs> okay. Um, what we want to do today is, I, last session I did not finish the right triangle discussion with these important trig ratios, so I want to make sure I pick up there. And possibly, I think I'm going to jump back to a problem on circular motion that was in the, uh, it's in the textbook, and we'll address that maybe to begin with. And then I'm going to uh, go back to that sine, cosine, trig, trig type of stuff and uh, make sure you start to become comfortable with that and we'll solve some right triangles. After we're done doing that, then we'll, that'll end the first segment today and then we'll do another, uh, then we're going to do some calculations, certain right triangle type of calculations that you're going to want to commit to memory, real simple Pythagorean theorem kind of calculations in segment two. And then segment three, a very important memory aid that's going to really help you in being able to handle trig type of problems is something called the unit circle. And so I want to make sure I get an introduction going on that with you today. Okay? So what we'll do is let's first of all start with a problem related to, I think we're on the equator of the Earth. If you look in your book on page 364, question 113, it was in, your, in the homework. And maybe someone can just sort of describe, describe that question to me. This is 113, page 364. So, somebody want to describe? How, how fast would you have to travel on the surface of Earth at the equator to keep up with the sun? Okay. That is, so the sun would appear to remain in the same position in the sky. Okay. So if I, if I draw a picture of the Earth, and we're down here on the equator, now, while, while we're at it, I want to point out a couple of things that you, you'll see in problems when you are in trigonometry. This is called the equatorial plane. Plant passing right through the center of the Earth down on the equator. Now, if you're on that plane and then you measure an angle above that equator into the northern hemisphere, if this is the North Pole up here and the South Pole is down here, if you measure an angle off of the equator upward to the Earth's surface, that's called latitude. That angle of measure is called latitude. Here in Eugene, Oregon, we're around 44 degrees north latitude. 44 degrees north latitude. If you drive up the freeway heading north, I-5, and you go past Salem, just past Salem, you'll see a sign along the road that says you're halfway to the North Pole or you're at 45 degrees north latitude. Okay? So what they were asking in this particular question is not about this type of an issue, but what they were asking is if the sun, if the Earth, the earth is rotating, okay? The Earth is rotating like this, all right? So we see that sun appear to rise in our eastern sky and then pass overhead and set in the west because the Earth is rotating towards that, towards the east, okay? So we know that the Earth is in rotation with some omega. What's the omega of the Earth in its rotation? takes 24 hours to make one complete revolution, right? So remember what omega is. It's angle over time. Angle over time. So we know there are 360 degrees, or one revolution, one revolution per day for the omega. But when we do calculations, we're normally not going to be doing it that way. It also rotates 360 degrees in one day, doesn't it? Okay, we're not going to do it that way either, 360 degrees per day. What we're going to want to do is to turn this into radian measure. And so you know that 360 degrees is equivalent to 2 pi, two pi radians per day then. So that, this is a way of describing the rotational rate of the Earth in any one of these forms. Now, what we want to do is to 
know how fast we would have to be traveling on the equator so that that sun would always appear to be at the same spot in the sky. In other words, keep up with the rotational rate of the Earth. Keep up with the rotational rate of the Earth. Does that make sense? So that sun always appears stationary in the sky. The radius of the Earth, the Earth is actually not perfectly spherical. Because of the gravitational forces, we talked about the merry-go-round last week a little bit, being on a merry-go-round, and somebody mentioned the force you feel trying to hold on when you're on the surface of that merry-go-round, right? So imagine the Earth, with all of the mass of the Earth, doing a complete revolution in 24 hours. There's quite a bit of force generated there by that motion. So what happens is the Earth is actually a little fatter across the equator than it is distance from the north to the south pole. It's called an oblate spheroid. It's not a perfect sphere, which is called a spheroid. It's oblated a little bit, it's squashed a little bit, and squeezed out in the equator. Make sense? Okay? Okay. The, ra the approximate rough radius, I think if you look at the previous problem in the book, or back in an example in there, or most textbooks at this level and beyond will have these kind of um, these kind of uh, features or constants built into it. I think it's around 3,960 miles. Okay, so the radius of the Earth is about 3,960 miles. Now we think of the Earth as pretty big. How far is it across the United States approximately? 3, A little over 3,000 miles. Now think about it. <laughs> Our planet that we live on is not a whole lot, another roughly 1,000 miles longer than, uh, for a radius, a, a little more than the distance going across the United States, okay? So we live on a pretty small planet. <laughs> How about the atmosphere? Does it seem like the atmosphere is very thick to us? It certainly does here, right? We're breathing and having a great old time, and this atmosphere gets thinner less dense the higher up in altitude you go. If you took a, like a basketball, kind of a rough approximation, and you took a, a piece of saran wrap and put it over the surface of that, that would kind of be a comparison to the, um, how the atmosphere lays over the surface of the Earth. Okay? So we have this very thin biosphere that we live in. in and all of the entire universe, you mean? Oh, speaking of the Earth. The atmosphere of the Earth is a very thin layer over the surface of the Earth, the atmosphere. And biological life lives in the oceans up into that atmosphere. And so it's a very thin layer where biological life exists. Okay, and we're part of that. But it's 90 miles, to a human, it's 90 miles tall. It's huge to us, but in relation to the, how big the universe is, it is like saran wrap over a basketball. Well, no, I'm just speaking of the Earth. Oh, really? Speaking of the size of the Earth, if you take 3,000, now, Take, well, look at this. This is close to 4,000 miles. You go up 100 miles and you could have a real low altitude orbit with a satellite. It would feel some friction from a very small amount of atmosphere at 100, just 100 miles. That's a 40th. Isn't that a 40th? Oh, yeah. Of this radius. So very uh, thin, very thin layer is this atmosphere around us. Okay? I'm trying to encourage you to take more science <laughs> courses. Okay. Now, Let's get back to the problem so we have a bunch of other material we have to cover today. And I've got to get to this right triangle stuff here uh, pretty quickly for this segment. So what we're trying to do is to keep this sun sort of stationary in the sky. So let me imagine we're looking down on this. So here's the sun. And the Earth is rotating like this. We're looking down. Here's our North Pole coming up at us. Okay, And we've got this radius. Of 3,960 miles, and what we want to do is make sure that that sun always appears to stay in the sky. So we're going to have to be traveling this direction, aren't we? We're going to have to travel that direction as the Earth rotates this way to be able to keep that sun appearing in the sky, stationary. Question? The orbit of the Earth doesn't affect it at all? No. 
And what, what her question was is the orbit of the Earth, does that affect it? Well, the orbit of the Earth, we're talking then about the, the fact that the entire planet, thinking of it as a particle, is rotating around the sun at a radius of about what? Around the sun. About 93 million miles. Not a bad number to kind of have in the back of your head. 93 million miles is the radius of our planet's orbit around the sun, approximately. It's not exactly that. It actually, it actually forms a more of a, like a football shape in the orbit, where it's further away at certain time of the year and closer at another time of the year. Okay, it's called an ellipse, an elliptical path. Okay, so that doesn't really affect this question. So. What is the question? Are we trying to figure out how fast we have to travel? Was that what the question is? How fast do we have to travel in this direction to be able to keep that sun appearing in the sky in the same spot? Okay. Well, as we discussed last week, we have to have a relationship to be able to take the given pieces of information here and drop them into that relationship to find out the unknown piece of information in the relationship. And that relationship you want to commit to memory, which I went over extensively with you last week, is this is the arc length formula, length of arc. And then if you divide that by time, holding the radius constant, we have this relationship, dividing by time, because we needed to get speed in there. And this became velocity and r times the Greek letter omega. So this is linear speed or linear velocity, and the omega is angular velocity or angular speed, angle per time. Talked about that in the last class session quite a bit. So what we're gonna do is drop the given information into here, and so we're looking for the speed that we have to travel, and our radius is 3,960 miles. And the omega, we have to have in radian measure, is 2 pi radians per day. 2 pi radians per day. And then, so we've got the items into our formula, including radian measure here, which is required. Let's see, Leah, or Brooke. This was your question, right? You okay so far with this? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So now, well, I guess we want probably miles per hour, which would be kind of interesting, right? How many miles per hour does it take? So then what do we have to do? Before we, ah, we have another conversion factor to tuck on here. We know in one day there are 24 hours because we want division by hour units. So day units disappear, reduce out. And remember what a ra radius is? A radius is equivalent to one radian of angle in rotation. So the radians disappear. And at that point you turn on your calculator. And I would eyeball this first. Roughly 4,000 times 2 is roughly 8,000 times pi over roughly a 25 or so. Okay, so I'd have a gut feeling for the kind of answer to get. What kind of answer comes out of this problem then with the calculator? About 1,036 miles per hour. Yeah, over 1,000 miles per hour. Okay, so you folks can finish this out. And did anybody else get that 1,036 or so? Yeah. Okay, now does that make much difference? No. How accurate is the 3,960? Oh. Not, not precise not precise, and how accurate is our rotational rate? Is it exactly two pi radians per day? No. It's good enough for this, brass tacks, this screwy calendar that we live with, which evolved from the Roman times, is not accurate. There are other calendars that are based on the, the lunar cycle, and those are actually much more accurate because they keep up with the rotational rates and the, and the cycles of the moon's uh, changing uh, cycles with us. Okay, so anyway, that takes care of that question. That, again, that's a review question from the previous section, previous material on rotational motion. Okay. And my problem wasn't so much with the formula, just that the, I guess the problem above it gave me a different yeah, number you, for the... Looking at different 
looking at a different problem than the description there. Picture. Okay, different picture. Okay, let's go back to, let's go to this right triangle stuff, try to wrap up the introduction on it and actually pick a problem or two out of the book then to solve right triangles. So right triangle problems. For if you're using this particular textbook, it's over in chapter eight, section one, right triangles. Now, Tim was asking the other day, or actually this morning, having cha being challenged by what's called the opposite side. So let's say you happen to be in here in this right triangle, which I introduced last session, and let's say we are looking at this angle up in here. Let's call this angle, like I did the other day, beta. Where is the opposite side from beta? Yeah, and the way I like to do this is I, I like to make this a little more real for myself. Imagine I have a large triangle, big one, that I can get inside. Imagine I'm up standing up inside here. And I look out and what I see is this side over here, which is opposite me, okay? So that's a handy way for you to think of what's opposite. Now adjacent, if I'm standing inside here, adjacent is laying right next to me, right here. And what we need to have memorized is those definitions that the Greeks derived several thousand years ago that we have to live with and all the millions of people that have studied this stuff since then. So if I put labels on these legs and this hypotenuse here, let's just call this H, or eh, let's call it C. And let's call this maybe A, uh, let me call this letter B, small b and call this small letter A. Then the Greeks defined, and I actually wrote the word out, and you look on your calculator and you don't see the whole word sign written out, like I spelled out in the last session. We abbreviate that, and that is not sin, it means sign, S-I-N-E, sine of angle beta. It's a ratio of two sides of this triangle by their definition which is opposite over hypotenuse. You have to know that. Opposite over hypotenuse. And in this particular case with this labeling, it's the opposite side is gonna be B, hypotenuse is clearly C. Okay. Got it? The cosine of angle beta not written out, but abbreviated like this, cos, we oftentimes just say cos beta, means cosine of angle beta. Did you notice that little word of? Function notation, folks. Remember f of x, the way we say that, f of x, the input is the x, and the f is the process that occurs to it, okay? So when we say sine of beta, sine of beta, we're talking about a functional value when we use an input of this particular angle value. Cosine of beta happens to be defined as what? Adjacent over hypotenuse. So if we're looking here at angle beta, this is our adjacent side, A. Adjacent over hypotenuse and that adjacent side is A, and the hypotenuse is clearly C. <coughs> yes? Is that in degrees or radians, or can it be interchangeable? Where? The beta or the ratio? Beta. The, the beta. degree measure. Yeah, the degree measure here, or the measure of the angle, can be either way. And that's why we started the class out last session, a couple sessions ago, talking about angle measure. Degree measure, we're fairly comfortable with, radian measure we are learning, right? Okay, so this angle can be in either degree measure or radian measure. Is there a, a notation that will tell you next to the beta if it's asking, like will there be a degree not, next not to the beta? Not next to this symbol here, no. but if I put an angle in there, you will be able to tell because there will either be that little superscript okay. for the circle or not. If there's no nothing next to it that number, like 30 degrees, if there's nothing next to it, 
like if I just wrote sine of 30, that would be interpreted as 30 radians. And would your calculator have to be in radians for you to do that? Correct. Okay. Good, good comment. If you're, if you're in radian measure and you want to do a calculation here, the sine of, say, 30 radians, you would have to be, make sure your calculator was in radian mode. And I showed you how to check that on your calculator on which mode you were in, radian or degrees, a couple sessions ago. Okay, we'll do that. Then there's a third ratio, very important, that I went over previously, last session, called the tangent. Tangent, tangent again, of angle beta, and that's going to be the opposite side, B, opposite, divided by the adjacent, and that's going to be B divided by A in this case. Now, three things I did not get to last session three other ratios, which are, and oh, uh, also, here, here's another thing, and then I'll talk about those other three. Th this is a length divided by a length, isn't it? Length over length. So this is a pure unit. Keep that in mind. That's why these things are called trig ratios. This is a pure number. There are no units associated with that ratio. Okay? So there's no units associated with this. And so these are ratios of, of two of the three sides of the right triangle. If you have three items, how many possible ways to f how many possible ways can you form ratios with three items? There are six possible ways. Okay. Well, we've got the first three. The other three are just reciprocals of these. T turn them upside down. Okay. So. If I, if I wanted the reciprocal of the sine of beta, uh, let's see, what's a better way to present that? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go ahead and give you the list. And I'm going to write it small down here so it'll fit in the order that we traditionally see them. Cotangent. Now, I'm not going to write the whole word out. Cotangent. I'm just going to abbreviate it the way we do cotangent of beta. In other words, secant, S-E-C-A-N-T of beta. And finally, cosecant, abbreviated C-S-C -C of beta. Now these are the reciprocals of the first three. And the way the reciprocals are formed is as I'm showing you right here. This is how the reciprocals are formed. So the reciprocal of sine of beta is the cosecant of beta. Reciprocal of secant is cosine. Reciprocal of cotangent is tangent. And so putting the ratio values in here using the A, Bs, and Cs, the reciprocal of B over A is A over B. The reciprocal of a over C is C over A. And finally, the reciprocal of B over C is C over B. We use these last three a lot less frequently than we do these first three. Okay? So we'll get practice with those. Don't worry about right now. Just try to remember that in this order, the way they pair up as far as reciprocals go is what I've shown you here. Let's go ahead now and work a problem. And we might as well just grab something out of the book. And this is in section 8.1 if you happen to have the text in front of you. And you've had some assigned homework on that material. Let's say I was doing a problem like number 16, number 16 on page 518, 16 on 518. Here's a right triangle. They've given us an angle theta. Here's our right angle. 
and they've told us two of the three sides. They've said this is the square root of three, and this is of length two. They've given us those two legs. Okay. They want us to figure out the trig ratios, all six of the trig ratios. All six of the trig ratios. Well, I guess we better figure out the length of that hypotenuse. We all know that, don't we? Right? <laughs> we all know that how to find the length of that hypotenuse. Okay. If we don't, we better go back and take college algebra again and maybe the courses before that. Okay. Square root of the sum of the squares of the legs. So the square root of square root of 3 being squared plus 2 being squared is going to be, be careful with that, that's equal to the square root of 3 plus 4 or square root of 7. Square root of 7. So we have the length of all three legs. Now, the sine of angle theta. Why don't you folks go ahead and write it down as an exact ratio. We want exact values of the ratios. We want the exact ratios. Write down what you get. Opposite angle theta is 2 divided by the hypotenuse, square root of 7. Do we leave it this way? No. Usually not. You usually don't leave a radical in the denominator. And so we want to make a rational number out of that denominator. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom here, 2 over radical 7, by square root of 7 top and bottom. And we end up with 2 radical 7 divided by 7. There's the sign reading. Any question? Confusion? Cosine, angle theta. Cosine, adjacent side, square root of 3. Adjacent divided by hypotenuse, square root of 7. Yes, Austin? Will math XL only take uh, the 2 root 7 over 7? Or would it take the other you one? You mean what's w when you punch, when you use the computer system and want to punch an answer in? Yeah. They oftentimes will say rationalize the denominator or write it in simplified form. So be aware, you usually don't want to leave a radical of the denominator, an irrational number. You usually want to rationalize it. This is a rational number 7, the integer 7. So you'd probably want to write it this way, okay? Similarly, on the cosine reading, adjacent over hypotenuse, and we're going to rationalize that by hitting, multiplying the numerator and denominator by square root of 7. And in the numerator, the, the product of two radicals is the square root of the product. In other words, square root of 21 over the rational number 7 for your cosine reading. How much more arithmetic do we really need to do? Not much. Not much. At this point, the tangent of angle theta is the opposite side over the adjacent side. So it would be 2 divided by square root of 3. And you, again, have a radical in the denominator, which we don't like, so we have to clean that up. So we end up with 2 times square root of 3 over 3 for the tangent reading. Now, what about your other three ratios? Once you've done this work, we just take the reciprocals of these results. So. And what I would do is I'd look back at my, notice how I've been encouraging you always write out your steps, because you're going to save yourself time. I joke around teaching math or engineering courses about how the, who wins the race, the hare or the tortoise? The tortoise wins the race, slow, plodding along, step by step. 
If you do that in math and science, you will get further ahead than if you try to do half of it in your head and zip along quickly. So look back at this work. If I took the reciprocal of this ratio right here, I'm going to be done with it. I would end up with, let me just go ahead and do it in that order, square root of 7 over the 2 is which one by definition? The reciprocal of sine is called the co cosecant. Cosecant of angle theta. There it is. I would look at my work on the cosine. Well, the cosine's got radicals both top and bottom in the original form, doesn't it? So it's going to still be kind of messy. So I might just go, um, you know, I might just take this original right here and get my secant reading. The reciprocal of this would be square root of 7 divided by square root of 3. And rationalize that denominator and get radical 21 over 3. And then the cotangent, I can pop in, I can squeeze it in right over there. The reciprocal of this for the cotangent of theta, and that's going to be square root of 3 over 2. Pretty good example. Notice we're not talking about what the value of the angle is. We'll talk about that real soon, though, the actual value of the measure of the angle. All right. One quick item before we end this segment so that this digital file of almost 30 minutes will be downloadable <laughs> is angle of elevation. If you've been in the military or been on fire watch on a, a lookout or something like that, we talk about angles of elevation, which is above the horizon line. This is horizontal here. So this is called an angle of elevation. AOE, if it's above the horizon line. Angle of depression, if you're on a watchtower up in the Cascades during fire watch in the summer, oftentimes you're on a high point and you're looking down at a ridge or valley or something in the distance and you might see smoke and you have an angle of depression. Angle of depression below the horizon line. angle of depression. Okay, so that kind of vocabulary shows up in some of the problems. Okay, let's stop this segment at this point and then we'll do some...